So this is all from my side. So Martin, uh, floor is yours, 40 minutes. Thank you, Özlem, for the introduction. Yeah, I will talk about a particular type of bias recommendations, which we call inflated recommendations. That's a situation when a product is recommended too often or is recommended to too many consumers. As mentioned by Özlem, this is joint work with my colleague here in Mannheim, Anton Sobolev. Um, so what I want to say is this is an issue of policy relevance, but I don't think that there's anything um, which should bias me in a major way. And that's what the slide is supposed to tell us. Now we have a model of biased recommendation. You can think about a firm, um, say an intermediary who recommends, has to decide whether to recommend a new product to consumers. And there are different types of consumers. And the important ingredient in our model is that there's some exante heterogeneity among consumers. There will be some consumers which can be, who can be pleased all of the time, but others cannot be pleased all of the time. And that's one way of uh, reading this phrase, which I've put up here. So ingredient, a key ingredient of our model is that you can't please all of the people, all of the time. Recommendations play an important role in many markets, in particular in the digital economy. We have recommender systems. Um, so these are then algorithmic solutions uh, which tell consumers uh, which kind of products they may want to look at, they may want to buy. And important, and that's an important ingredient, uh, what we have been seeing in the digital economy is that many of those recommendations are personalized. So they are conditioned on some characteristics of consumers. The kind of recommendations we're looking at here are recommendations for a new product, uh, which will be an experience good. So that means consumers are initially or at least some consumers are initially uncertain about the value, um, the consumption value they will obtain. And a recommendation becomes biased if consumers end up uh, buying products uh, which are not in their best interest to buy. And clearly in an experience good setting that can be a product which delivers a valuation which is less than the price. Uh, I mentioned that there's some policy interest in bias recommendations. We see this in particular in the case of first party content or first party products and the issue of self-preferencing, but it applies more generally also to cases where only third party products are offered, but for example, they generate different commissions or they generate uh, different uh, conversion rates. What we aim to do in this paper is not to have a general theory, but a very specific model which allows us to look at a particular type of biased recommendations. And as I mentioned already, the key element here will be some exante heterogeneity. In particular, and this is the basic idea of the model, there will be two uh, types of consumers. Uh, some consumers we call flexible consumers. They like this uh, new product. There's some uh, positive valuation they get, which is above the cost or above the opportunity cost of providing uh, that product. And this uh, gain, if you think is, uh, if there's some base product out there, this gain is above what the base product can offer. And then there are the picky consumers and for them it depends. Uh, so it might be that they very much like the product but it might be that they have a somewhat a lower um, consumption value compared to the flexible consumers. These are then the consumers who can benefit from advice, who can benefit from a recommendation such that they are recommended the product only in case where the, this new product delivers a good consumption experience. <clears throat> the, to 
place this in an e-commerce setting, we are allowing for two distribution channels. There will be a direct distribution channel and an indirect channel. The indirect one, that's when the consumers buy through an intermediary. This intermediary offers uh, to is different from selling uh, from the direct purchase in two ways. First, consumers, all consumers, uh, obtain a higher benefit using this indirect channel, maybe superior logistics. And uh, the consumers who rely on recommendations, they may benefit from the recommendations provided in the indirect channel. So it's the intermediary who can provide those recommendations, those recommendations are not available on the direct channel. And in this setting, the intermediary may maximize its profits by inflating recommendations. And inflating recommendations here means that picky consumers receive a recommendation not only when their consumption experience will be good, but also with positive probability when the co consumption experience will be not so good. And the reason the intermediate wants to do this, it has to deal with this ex ante heterogeneity of consumers and uh, what it is doing, it is reducing the heterogeneity of the expected consumer valuations for those consumers who buy. And this allows for a better surplus extraction on the consumer side. Okay. The intermediary may pick this inflated recommendation um, outcome. So it means recommending it to some of the picky consumers who dislike the, the product. And uh, all consumers who buy will buy through the indirect channel. So in the sense of uh, thinking about is it efficient where consumers buy? Yes, it is efficient because the indirect channel provides the uh, additional consumption benefit over the direct channel. But the inefficiency here is that some of the picky consumers buy who actually dislike the product and that uh, reduces uh, surplus. The other possible outcome is one which we call inefficient bypass. Here, there, the recommendation is not biased, and it will be only the picky consumers who actually like the new product who will buy the product from the intermediary. The price will be such that the flexible consumers will not buy through the intermediary. They will buy on the direct channel, and therefore the inefficiency from a total surplus perspective is that some consumers buy through the less efficient uh, distribution channel. There is a question, Martin, uh, from Jacques Kramer. So he's asking whether the indirect channel you meant here is, for instance, buying a game or an app uh, or subscription through the app store rather than directly from through the publisher, for instance. Would that also apply to that context? Uh, to the extent that these recommendations also matter on the App Store, yes, that uh, is also applicable. So you can think it in the, in the in App Store context. Um, I think when I will phrase it, I will more I will put it more in an e-commerce setting that you have sellers, uh, for example, a hotel. You can book directly on the hotel, or you can do it through a, a hotel booking portal. Okay, so here's a very simple model. Um, we have an experience good, uh, which is introduced in the market. They are picky and flexible consumers. The fraction is exogenous. A fraction alpha is picky. The picky consumers have high or low valuation. Here, for simplicity, just suppose that the probability is one half, one half. And then they're the flexible consumers, and for this presentation, they have some uh, value, they derive some consumption value VM, and that is greater than the marginal cost of production. Consumers know their type, so they know whether they are picky or flexible. However, the picky consumers do not know. Uh, upfront, whether the realization will be VH or VL. 
Uh, we're assuming here that the, the flexible consumers have a higher um, expected valuation. And uh, then these valuations are the valuations buying in the direct channel. There's the convenience benefit of buying through the indirect channel B, which comes on top, and that applies to all consumers. And in addition, what the intermediary does, it is providing a recommendation. It's, it's easy to see that the intermediary will always recommend a good match. Uh, so the probability of recommending a good match is one, and therefore the only parameter, the only variable uh, we need here is the variable beta, uh, which is the probability that a bad match is recommended. So when a picky consumer actually has VL, which the picky consumer doesn't know, but the intermediary knows, and the intermediary then can decide to um, recommend the product to this picky consumer, even though the intermediary knows that the evaluation is VL and can do so with any positive probability between zero and one. Okay, so here I put another parameter restriction in there, but I don't think that this is important, but um, we have to, uh, the full analysis depends a little bit on where we are in the parameter space. So here we have um, the marginal cost being above the uh, exante expected valuation of a picky consumer buying through the indirect channel. So let me illustrate what that means in terms of willingness to pay. So uh, consider first the case that the uh, intermediate, that the recommendation is fully informative. Uh, this is beta is equal to zero. Beta equal to zero means that none of the picky consumers with a bad match receives a recommendation, okay? So that means then we have these, this black uh, demand curve. Uh, they are those consumers who are picky and have a high valuation. So they are willing to pay VH plus B. Uh, next come the flexible consumers with a valuation VM plus B. And finally, the picky consumers uh, with a bad match with valuation VL plus B. Okay. Um, the opposite case would be to have a fully uninformative recommendation, uh, say um, recommend the product uh, to all picky consumers. In that case, uh, con picky consumers cannot update uh, their belief. And what we have is the, the valuation a VM, the willingness to pay VM plus B for the flexible consumers and VL plus VH over two plus B for uh, the picky consumers, okay? And what we see under the assumption that actually this marginal cost is above VL plus VH over two plus B, uh, two prices can be profit maximizing. It's either VH plus B or it is uh, Vm plus B. And what we can see then, if we want to sell at Vm plus B, we can actually do better than having this fully uninformative recommendation policy. Uh, we can pick some interior beta uh, so as to uh, equate, uh, to equalize the willingness to pay of the flexible consumers with the expected willingness to pay of all picky consumers who receive a recommendation, okay? And uh, you can see that's of course better than running beta equal to one. Uh, therefore, we have two possible outcomes, one with inflated recommendation, the other one where only the picky consumer with a good match will buy, they will then have to pay VH plus B and the, um, the flexible consumers 
will be served outside the intermediaries channel, outside the indirect channel. Okay. So let me look first at what uh, is uh, the vertically integrated firm. So it's one firm, which is both selling and doing a recommendation. The recommendation policy, as I said, is then just uh, this beta, the probability of recommending uh, a product to a picky consumer with a bad match. And the firm will set prices on the indirect and the direct channel. Consumers observe their type and they decide whether to go to the direct or the indirect channel. And if they go to the indirect channel, they receive a recommendation. Um, important are only the recommendations here for the picky consumers. And this recommendation is then used by the consumers uh, to update their beliefs. What I spell out on this page, and I think I can rather go through this quickly because I already gave the intuition of what is happening. There are two potentially optimal strategies, inflated recommendation or inefficient bypass. Uh, the inefficient bypass outcome is uh, straightforward. So here the price on the indirect channel is the VH plus B as we saw on the, um, in the uh, drawing and the figure and the price in the direct channel well is again is now the full surplus extraction of the flexible consumers and their willingness to pay for the direct channel is vm here there's no uh, recommendation bias and we can write down what are the profits of the firm using this strategy alternatively the firm can use the inflated recommendation strategy in which case it will extract the surplus from the flexible consumers in the indirect channel, that's uh, VM plus B. Everybody who buys will buy in the indirect channel and beta is just picked uh, such that the conditional expected willingness to pay of the picky consumers or those who receive a recommendation is just equal to um, what the... Um, consumers, um, what the flexible consumers are willing to pay. And there's a typo that should be VM plus B. Okay. And then there's a cutoff alpha. So it depends on the fraction of picky versus um, flexible consumers, whether there is inflated recommendation or there is inefficient bypass. So if this fraction of picky consumers is sufficiently small, there will be inflated recommendations and otherwise there will be inefficient bypass. Uh, should be clear if they're just, uh, there's a very large fraction of uh, picky consumers, then you don't want to give up on the, uh, the surplus uh, of those um, picky consumers and want to extract as the, as the firm VH plus B and therefore there will be inefficient bypass. Yeah. Uh, whereas if that fraction is small, well then uh, you uh, rather want to enjoy the, the price VM plus B instead of VM you can get from the flexible consumers and uh, then do the best to extract uh, surplus from the picky consumers and this is by introducing inflated recommendations. So we can then embed this into a, the setting where now the intermediary and the seller are not identical. Uh, we have now the intermediary formulating a recommendation policy. So this beta is now conditioned on the, the retail prices. And I believe that uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, recommend uh, recommender systems, recommendations do depend on uh, the prices which are set by sellers. And uh, here we are looking at the intermediary who commits to such a recommendation policy and uh, asks for a share of the profit in the, in the indirect channel um, for 
uh, from the seller. Second then, um, given the intermediary's recommendation policy and the price or the profit share it asks from the seller, the seller sets the retail prices on the indirect channel and the direct channel, and then the game continues as we have seen before. Uh, consumers learn their types, make a choice between the two channels, and if they are in the indirect channel, they receive a personalized recommendation. <clears throat> what will happen in this model? Well, it will exactly the same thing as in the vertical integrated model. So the solution will be in a way decentralized. And uh, why that is the case, it's easy to see that the seller's outside option uh, is always to sell to flexible consumers in the direct channel. So it can sell at VM, uh, incur the unit cost C and sell to the fraction one minus alpha consumers. So that's what the seller can make for sure, um, but the seller cannot make anything on top of that. Um, the recommendation policy beta can be formulated uh, such that uh, all the additional surplus which can be extracted from consumers then goes to the intermediary. And this is done by adjusting in the inflated recommendation outcome, the lambda uh, in a way that the, the seller is indifferent as to whether to sell through the indirect channel or whether to pick the outside option. Yeah. And uh, since we have the same outcome, it means we obtain exactly the same critical alpha uh, which separates the case where we have inflated recommendations from the one with uh, inefficient bypass. And this is stated in this uh, proposition here. Um, so again, uh, we have this critical threshold alpha bar and what the intermediary is doing to implement the inflated recommendation outcome is to have a recommendation policy such that when the, the seller sets the price in the indirect channel equal to VM plus B and uh, sets a sufficiently high price in the direct channel, it will use inflated recommendations according to beta star. And otherwise it will be completely uninformative. And this is one way of implementing implementing inflated recommendations. The uh, associated welfare uh, in our solution is the blue straight, the solid blue line. And uh, clearly here we have an inefficiency and this inefficiency is due to the ex ante heterogeneity of consumers. And the borderline cases where there are only picky consumers or only flexible consumers, we obtain uh, the first best outcome. But there are welfare losses whenever there is a mix of flexible and picky consumers. So this was my claim that this model really relies on ex ante heterogeneity. And the welfare loss is uh, depends on whether we're under inflated recommendations or inefficient bypass. The inefficient bypass case, uh, there the welfare loss is uh, due to the fact that some consumers buy through the inefficient channel, which is the direct channel. And the, the welfare loss in the inefficient, um, in the inflated recommendation outcome is that some picky consumers with a bad match buy. Now you may find the model particularly uh, in some ways uh, special. Um, the message I want to convey is that uh, this kind of inflated recommendation uh, appears to us a very robust phenomenon relying here on ex ante consumer heterogeneity. Um, 
so here we have this specific setting just of two types. Uh, one type, there's this uncertainty, it's VH or VL. Uh, the other one, there's no uncertainty. So there's a change, uh, there's a difference both in the expected valuation and in the variance. Now you can keep the variance the same and just change the expected valuation. This model becomes somewhat richer. That's why we focused on this one here. There are different types of inflated recommendation outcomes, uh, which can then obtain. But the general message that recommendations uh, will be inflated uh, is preserved. And this we can also then uh, write down with a continuous type model. Another alternative is uh, to actually work with heterogeneous uh, consumer, inf ex ante heterogeneous consumer information instead of uh, working on the preferences. And also that's a way how we can generate biased recommendation. So in that sense, I think uh, we have a, uh, the outcome of biased recommendation is not specific to one particular type of modeling ex ante heterogeneity, but ex ante heterogeneity in general is a, a reason why um, recommendations will be biased. Let me make a comment on the related literature. Um, so I only put up here one reference uh, for each um, bullet point and I understand that the audience is an expert audience uh, and uh, there are some other contributions. So we do uh, cite a few more papers in the references in the paper. But of course, if you think that for some strange reason we have overlooked you, shout out and we're happy uh, to to improve our exposition on the related literature. So um, quite clearly we are contributing to the literature on recommendation biases. Um, a different way at looking at what we do is uh, call this targeted advertising. When you think about um, advertising a product and uh, as the advertiser or the intermediary deciding on which ad to put, you may have information on consumer characteristics. And uh, if you use that information, then you can go for targeted advertising. What we show here, inflated recommendation, means that you're not fully targeting. You could be uh, provide a better targeting, but you decide not to. And the reason is that this allows you to sell more units. At the general level, uh, this is just an uh, particular instance uh, of uh, Bayesian persuasion, what we're doing here, uh, looking at um, the direct and the indirect sales channel is a contribution uh, to analyzing the dual mode and uh, looking at what um, here firms, possibly also partially vertically integrated firms optimally do. Um, I was showing you the, the distribution of the willingness to pay in the derived demand curve, depending on the recommendation policy. In a way, you can see this as a kind of demand rotation, or at least, uh, yeah, you, you stretch and, and rotate demand uh, in the sense of uh, Johnson and Myatt. And uh, this also relates to a paper by Rhodes and Wilson on false advertising, where here you can call the recommendation of a bad match as a false advertising, if you want. Yeah. And uh, what we have uh, is that this is an uh, equilibrium phenomenon without any uh, punishments by outsiders for false advertising. Here, you want to do, use this kind of false advertising inflated recommendations because of ex ante uh, heterogeneity among consumers. And so that's the new, our new ingredient. Now, if you think about these picky consumers who can have a high valuation or a low valuation, this you can think about two different states of the world then if you recommend the product only in case the valuation is high, then you sell the product independently. 
or you can recommend it uh, both if it's VH and VL, in which case uh, you're essentially selling the bundle. And what inflated recommendations then is, is a mix between selling the product uh, in separately and selling the pure bundle because we're you're selling the product with a good match with probability one and the product with a bad match with some strict positive probability um, probability strictly less than one and in terms of the outcome we have uh, recall that by using these inflated recommendations the picky consumers will buy the product with strictly positive probability when they experience then a bad match. Now think instead of a refund contract. A refund contract is when you sell a product and give the option to consumers after purchase to return it if they didn't like it. Now, if we introduce a refund contract where you have only a probabilistic return right, then uh, this the outcome is essentially the same as what we have here because then consumers with a bad match will try to use this option to uh, return the product. They only can do so with positive probability. And this is then the same thing as those consumers not receiving the recommendation to buy the product and therefore they don't buy it in the first place. So that's our my quick uh, relationship uh, to the literature. What we then do in this paper is to look at a number of regulatory policies where the, the regulator imposes restrictions on the recommendation policy. First, um, suppose that the, the regulator can fully condition this uh, recommendation beta on the retail prices, on PI and PD. Uh, and then we move to a much more restrictive uh, recommendation policy, namely one where the intermediary is not allowed to recommend the product uh, to picky consumers with a bad match. And then we introduce um, a recommendation cap where the interpretation is, well, this is the uh, regulator is more lenient and allows for uh, up to a certain level, it allows uh, for these, this inflation to uh, take place. And uh, well, so I think these are the, the ones I want to, um, want to mention in this presentation. Now, if the, the regulator can fully control the recommendation policy without uh, controlling any price, so neither the lambda, that's the price or the profit share extracted by the intermediary, nor the retail price itself, it is actually able to implement the first best. So that means uh, when only when the regulator is more limited in its instruments um, will we get something which is different from the first best. Now, clearly, if the um, if the regulator imposes a very strict uh, rule, namely that uh, inflation, inflated recommendations are not allowed, uh, then we obtain a deviation, we obtain a result which is different from the first best. What will happen? Now, if the fraction of picky consumers is sufficiently small, then uh, this policy improves on the laissez-faire uh, because in the laissez-faire, the, the intermediary would introduce some level of inflated recommendation. Now this is ruled out, um, but then the uh, intermediary still prefers to sell to everybody uh, on uh, to uh, uh, choose a policy such that uh, everybody who buys will buy through the indirect channel. However, uh, for some intermediate range alpha, uh, the trade-off between selling everything on the indirect channel or 
uh, having some sales uh, on the direct channel and another fraction on the indirect channel, this trade-off is different. Now for a smaller critical alpha, uh, do I want to move um, as the intermediary uh, to the outcome, which is uh, then inefficient bypass? And therefore, this regulatory policy can backfire and deliver an outcome, an outcome which is worse than the laissez-faire. And uh, if alpha is then sufficiently large, um, this policy is uh, neutral, we will get the inefficient uh, bypass outcome in any case. If we allow for recommendation caps, which are here conditioning on the alpha, then we can show that this policy weakly improves on the laissez-faire. And um, here, uh, what we get is an intermediate range where the policy allows for some inflation so as to uh, make sure that all trade still happens on the intermediary. Um, and uh, this is then this line which lies above uh, the laissez-faire outcome. What is important for our result to hold is that while prices here depend on the distribution channel, they do not depend on the consumers uh, in the sense that there is no personalized pricing. Uh, clearly, if, they, if there was a possibility of using personalized pricing, then there wouldn't be any reason to keep uh, consumers outside the indirect channel and this benefit B would materialize. So therefore, uh, there wouldn't be also then any reason to inflate recommendations because inflating recommendations reduces total surplus. And since personalized prices... Are, Pricing allows for surplus extraction in any case. Uh, this can't be the optimal uh, thing to do for, for the intermediary and the seller. And also, I think it's important uh, to see what our model uh, does is assuming that there is this new product out there and it can really deliver bad experiences. If there's a large set of products out there such that consumers can always make a good experience, then there's no reason to make a recommendation favor uh, towards a product delivering a bad experience compared to one with a good experience. So that means what we are essentially implicitly assuming is that we don't have a variety of products out there such that all consumers can be um, can obtain a high valuation. Uh, the intermediate price instruments do not matter here uh, the, and uh, price parity uh, clauses here are not beneficial for the intermediary. So that means uh, our results do not really rely on this. Now, one uh, variation you may think is perhaps more realistic is that uh, the recommendation policy should apply uh, for all alpha. Uh, so that means there's a different uh, product categories out there and uh, this uh, with different, uh, where the composition of consumers is different and the recommendation policy should then not condition alpha. Uh, this means this would imply that inflating recommendation becomes somewhat less attractive, but it will still be an equilibrium outcome. So the, the critical alpha uh, will be above zero, but less than the critical alpha we have determined here. Um, perhaps one last thing I want to mention given time is that we also look at platform leakage. Platform leakage is then the situation where consumers can first go to the indirect channel, obtain a recommendation, and then still decide to go to the direct channel afterwards. If that applies to a fraction of consumers, so not to everybody, but to a fraction of consumers, then what we will actually get is more inflated recommendations. So it's not only that inflated recommendations remain robust. On top of that, these inflated recommendations hold for a larger set of circumstances. I think I used up um, the pre-assigned 40 minutes. 
there is much more one can do, and there are quite a number of things we do in the paper. And uh, if you're interested, um, well, the paper is publicly available. Excellent. Thank you very much, Martin. You are very good on time. Thank you. So, uh, Hesky, uh, please, floor is yours for five minutes sure. of discussion. So, uh, th so uh, thanks, thanks to the organisers for for giving me the opportunity to to read the paper. Um, I read some of it. It's ninety pages, which is um, with, with with the appendices. So, when Martin said there's plenty more to to chew over in the paper. Uh, this was this was not just for effect. The, the, there's there's plenty here. Um, I want to sort of step back from from the details for a second, and then I'll then I'll talk you through um, you know my perspective on the paper from the from the literature that that I know. So I was very happy that in the related literature section, um, Martin put Kem Chemnitz and Jenskow. Which in the version of the paper that I have, there's there's no reference to, but but to some extent, I think that's the that's the closest reference. So I mean, I think the the big picture overview is one that's familiar to this group um, and is and, and has some novel economics, which is the importance of these of these gatekeepers in managing what what retail competition looks like, in managing what consumers uh, know. And and I think there's been a focus in the last few years on 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 this gatekeeper role, in part due to reports like like Jacques, if he's uh, still online, and 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 others, and this recognition that through their through in large part the information that they provide through consumers, whether that's um, rankings in in positions or information directly, is is uh, or opportunity to acquire information is stuff that Vicente and Guillermo and I were, were thinking about a while back. Um, that has the capacity to influence what demand looks like, what prices look like, what the nature of competition looks like. And, and I think these are important questions and, and uh, finding nice tractable models where in particular we can think about the effects of policy, which is what you know, some of these uh, 90 pages are about, a good chunk of that is is geared up to trying to think about uh, some plausible policies, I think is um, important and is, is very valuable. Um, anybody who knows me in these seminars know that I, I like to start from thinking at specific applications. So um, that was something that I was missing a little bit in, in, in the paper. Uh, are we thinking about Amazon? Are we thinking about um, hosts? Like, wh what are we thinking about? A little bit delicate because consumers have the choice of whether to go to this indirect or direct channel first. And then once they've gone to one channel or another, having observed prices in these channels, that, that's it, they're, they're done. So that was a little bit hard for, for me to think about. I appreciate the, the extensions. Much easier for me to think about is what, um, what Martin calls the, the vertically integrated case. I think actually a, another interpretation of the vertically integrated case that's a bit more natural to me is just to assume away the direct channel. So when, when I go to Amazon, it never even occurs to me that a lot of the stuff I could buy, I could go and, and find somewhere else. So in, in the model, you know, that is just the vertically integrated channel, or you could think of setting B up to infinity or, or thinking about some comparative statics with B would be relatively easy to implement. But that's a much easier uh, application for me to think about. And I think it brings it a lot closer to existing literature, like whether that literature is Kamenit and Jenskow or I'm, I'm realizing now that I'm very old, I still think in terms of Lewis and Sappington. Um, uh, you know, uh, who, who had these models of uh, providing information um, that was a, a very specific form of information provision that, that, that we then saw evolve uh, with um, Justin and, and, and David's work. And um, there's a very nice version of Lewis and Sappington that, that you know, even before Kamnich and Jenskow that deals with an unstructured format that's a, an economics letters paper by uh, Alex Sack. And I can provide reference later that just says, you know, for a monopoly, if I could choose price and if I could choose information, all I'd want to tell you is, is your valuation above marginal cost or not? And then I can extract the full consumer surplus. So what, what we have here 
I, I think kind of builds on on those intuitions that you know if I'm targeting a price I'm just gonna lead you to have an average valuation equal to that price and here what gets me to target specific prices potentially is the presence of this heterogeneity which I think is very interesting so for me it's like easier to come at it from that way and then introduce the um introduce the uh indirect channel it, I mean for a lot of the results for this inflation you don't need the indirect channel at all and so I think kind of being sorry the direct channel at all and uh, and the bypass associated with the with the direct channel this these two forms of this inefficiency so the the paper is titled inflated recommendations but then this other form of inefficiency is buying this stuff directly and paying this higher uh, uh, penalty from not having the convenience of Amazon or, or whatever it is. And I think if you want to have that uh, second um, uh, form of inefficiency, you have to justify it a lot more, discuss what it, its relevance, its importance, and, and, and explore it to a, to a greater extent than, than, than you do. Um, I've probably gone over time already. So I, I hope that was of, of some use. Again, the kind of big picture I, I, I very much appreciate. And, and, and in terms of the paper, I think I would start with just ignoring the direct channel, uh, bring it closer to some existing literature. So Kamlich and Jenskow and, and, and stuff like that for me should be the first reference and then and move from there. But um, great stuff.